So how many of you have used MongoDB in the past? OK, cool. So this is going to be a very intro talk. Um, so you don't need any prior knowledge. Um, hopefully, you'll recognize Python syntax. Other than that, you don't need to know anything about Mongo. Um, so uh, the, the general idea is that it's a database that's designed for the way that we write code today rather than the way that code was written back in the COBOL days. Um, so the idea is that with Mongo, um, the data storage is actually, the, the native type is basically JSON, which means that basically you're going to be able to store your objects directly in the database and get them back out in the same format that you put them in. Um, I've heard the, uh, one of the interesting analogies I've heard to a relational database, once you get everything into the proper normalized form where you, know, you, you take everything out, split up in multiple tables, that's roughly equivalent to when you drive home, um, you pull into your garage, you then you know, get out your uh, tire wrench, take out all of the nuts from your tires, put them in a box together, take each of your four wheels, stack them together, take your engine out, take each of the cylinders out of that, put those in their own box, and then you know, in the morning, try to undo all of that and hope that you get the same car back out. And you know, then you wonder why you're late to work. Um, so the idea with Mongo is that you would just be able to drive your car, park it directly in the garage, and be done with it. Anyway, so um, <clears throat> this is going to be a um, fairly basic intro to using it with, um, uh, with uh, Python specifically. Um, I'll mention that this is the first time I'm using IPython Notebook. Um, I actually discovered it um, during one of the tutorials on Thursday. Um, and then quickly ported my old presentation to this format. So hopefully it'll go well. Um, also mention that if you want something to try out, um, if you go to our website, there's a try it out button, which will drop you straight into a Mongo shell. Uh, here you have to type JavaScript, because that's the language that our shell uses. But um, it's pretty much the same. Just use uh, camel case rather than under bars. And that's basically the only difference. All right, let me go back into this. So ignore some of this setup stuff. You kind of just have to have that in there for the rest of this to work. Just run through this. So what we've got here, um, this would be kind of the start of the actual uh, PyMongo stuff. So you need to pull in PyMongo, um, and that's kind of the root uh, object. Um, that's going to be the, the main library. There's also the BSON library. Um, which is our serialization format. It's a binary form of JSON. Um, it's actually how everything gets communicated with the server. Um, it has a few extensions to JSON types. Um, it is a, a superset and includes things like uh, a, just a, a direct binary type, so that if you had to store some binary blobs, say SHA hashes, you don't have to base64 or anything like that. You can just store binary directly in the database. Um, also, there's a special object ID type that I'll be talking about shortly. From there, um, just do pymongo.connection. Um, that'll create you a connection object. By default, it'll connect to localhost on the default port. Um, alternatively, you can specify host, port, uh, password, username, all that kind of stuff. Um, but by default, it just connects to localhost. Um, from here, um, you get a database object. Um, you can either use the um, uh, square bracket notation or the dotted notation, depending on whichever you feel like using. Um, so that just grabs the uh, the test database of the, off the connection. And I'm also going to, oops, I guess skip something. There we go, that's better. So, and then I'm going to go ahead and drop the database just to make sure everything starts clean. And then we're going to start talking about CRUD. So this is the basic create, retrieve, update, and delete. So in particular, this is going to be talking about a blog engine, just because everyone knows roughly what they are and what they do. So um, for starters, um, let's take a look at a post object. So you probably recognize this. It's just a normal dictionary. Um, and so the most basic post that I can imagine is a title, my first post, body, I wrote something, and me as the author. Um, and from here, all I need to do is save it. So here, I'll go ahead and put that in the database. Um, you'll note that it will return the object ID. 
Um, and if I were to print the post now, you will see that the object ID has been added as the underscore ID field. Um, we did standardize on uh, the primary key is always called underscore ID. Um, has anyone worked on a project where they, did, you know, for whatever reason, didn't have a standard primary key? So you'd get some tables that were ID, some that were underscore ID, some that were table name ID, some table name underscore ID. We decided we're going to have none of that. Every project will use underscore ID as the primary key. Make it very simple. From there, you can do whatever you want, but at least the primary key will be standardized. Um, additionally, you automatically get an index, a unique index on the primary key. You don't have to manually create that or anything like that. So anyway, um, one thing I'll mention, um, you'll note this is an object ID. We don't actually require that you use object IDs, um, but it's a nice type um, if you don't have a natural key. Um, so if you would use, in a relational database, a auto-increment primary key, um, what I would suggest instead is to just use object ID, which gets created for you. Um, and they are very similar to UUIDs um, in that they can be generated client-side with a good guarantee of uniqueness, but they are um, d better designed for being stored as the primary key of a database. Um, one minor difference is that uh, object IDs are a um, 12 bytes rather than 16 bytes. That's four bytes right there. But additionally, um, the first four bytes are actually a timestamp. And what that means is that it's going to be roughly increasing, which uh, can reduce index fragmentation. And um, if you're into these kind of optimizations, it'll give you a right balanced index, which has all sorts of nice things for B trees. But if you don't know what any of that means, don't worry about it. It doesn't really uh, make that much difference. Um, but anyway, so uh, it does give you a roughly increasing uh, key which means that, roughly speaking, you can get things that are newer than an object by grabbing its object ID and looking for things newer. Um, additionally, you can, um, all of the drivers support the ability to get the time that this object ID was created. So I could say um, object ID dot generation time, and that actually returns a, uh, a date type in whichever language you're using. So in Python, that would be a date, ty date time dot date time object, uh, which if you stringify it will show um, the current time in a reasonable manner. Excuse me. Um, so that's creation. Pretty easy. Um, one of the nice things to note is that you don't have to go in and tell the database what you're going to be putting in there. I didn't have to create the table posts. I didn't have to tell, uh, create the scheme. I didn't have to list all the fields or what their types would be. I can just put the data directly in the database. Um, so it's designed to be pretty easy to get up and running. So. Um, for retrieving, um, it's actually uh, quite simple. Um, we, uh, there, there's, there's two methods to get data out. Um, there's going to be a find one, which unsurprisingly retrieves one object. Um, and so the way that you would query is uh, something known as query by example. So you provide a object with some fields, and then it will try, the database will find objects that have matching uh, fields. So if you say ID is post ID, so this is pulling the ID out of this post, um, you'll see that it will fetch. So that's how you find the object. This is going to the database, finding it, and finding something with this ID matching. Um, it, alternatively, you can use any other field. So this is a primary key. It's the same syntax to look for any field. So this is find a post um, written by Matthias. So that would be here. Um, if I were to put in someone else, oops. clearly that doesn't match anyone. Yes? Ah, so the DB is the database object. If I scroll back to here, you can see I'm grabbing that. Um, the collections in the database are all um, can all be accessed via just dot notation. Um, so you can do db.post to get to the post collection of the test database. Um, what? Yes. So the whenever a, a database or a, sorry, a, both a database and a collection are both created automatically when you first put something in them.
It's important to note that post is a collection, not the database. It is sometimes a confusion. Whenever you see db dot something, that means the thing after the dot's a collection. Um, also, you are allowed to use dot in a um, collection name, and you can actually use that to say like post dot meta, and then you could have like metadata about the posts collection. Um, dot is a legal name, and any driver that supports this kind of dot notation also supports um, kind of chaining it out. Um, the database, it's not like it creates a, a hierarchy in terms of the database, but it does give you kind of like a, a uh, organization for yourself. Anyway, um, so that was find one. Obviously, it finds one. Um, if you want more than one thing, you can use uh, just find, which returns a cursor. And a cursor can be iterated over using normal Python iteration. So here, um, currently, there's only one post. But if there were more, it would print them all. Um, I'll show you a, uh, how to use this without an ORM. Um, there are some object document mappers, which can give you some nice features like validation and all of that other stuff that you can get with um, some, uh, some, of, some ORMs. Also, uh, I believe uh, Mongo Engine is one of them that provides uh, an API compatibility with the Django ORM. So there's a couple of these kind of things that if you already have a code base, you can do some more mild changes to convert it into a uh, Mongo compatible. No. So a string and the object ID are considered distinct types. So if you pass it to a string, it would look for something with that string rather than with the object ID. Um, so if you want to use an object ID in a query, you have to convert it to an object ID and then use that as the query. Um, but I'm, you can also, you don't have to use, uh, I'll mention that you don't have to use the object ID as your ID. You can use, uh, for example, if you're doing a user's collection, you might want to put the user ID as the underscore ID. Uh, things like that. So if you have a natural key, you should probably go ahead and use it. So just a, a very simple, um, it's a, a, a very simple, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, ORM-like thing that doesn't, you know, kind of cloud up anything. But it, what it will let you do is say, um, fetch by ID, and then just put the results of the find into under under dict. Um, which, uh, if you're not familiar with it, that's basically the storage area for your class. Um, so this kind of populates the class with what's in there. Um, additionally, you can save, which would just save the results of the dictionary. So that lets you convert from a, um, from a dictionary directly into a class, or into an object. So let me run this, and just to show you. Um, so that generated a post object. And let's see if I can do this without typoing. Um, post obj. One nice thing about this is that if you're doing this in some sort of a shell that has autocompletion, you can kind of do things like hit tab and see the fields. So if I run this, you can see that it'll say that. I could do post dot title and say um, you can fetch things out like that rather than using a dictionary. Additionally, you could have other methods on here and so on. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, updating is also quite simple. Um, the simplest way to do it is just to modify an object and then save it. Um, this is, would be equivalent to just modifying a dictionary and then uh, calling save on the dictionary. If you take a look, that's all that this is doing, is just modifying a dictionary and then saving the dictionary. Um, and then refetching it will show you that when you, even when you, pull it, when you pull it back out of the database, you can see the new changes applied. So here, I've went ahead and I added a, uh, an exclamation point to the title, and I've marked this as edited. So I didn't have to um, do any sort of alter table. Um, when I went to add this feature, I just had to add the field and save it, and the field gets uh, stored directly. And it is there when you retrieve it. Any questions so far? Yeah? So regarding the generation time from the ID, I think we shouldn't rely on that, because at the moment you dump and restore the connection to another one, you don't want the ID to So we still need the, the ID to 
So that's partially true. Um, but if you were to dump it, uh, it, it when you dump the, the database, it will actually include the ID. So when you restore it, you'd get the same ID, which means that the, uh, the generation time would be correct. Yes, um, because so the ID is generated client side, so it's generated in the application code, um, which means that it, when you insert it, inserts it with the ID. Um, and so when you when you take a dump and restore, um, it would still get generated. Uh, it, it would still use the same one. It's not it's not generated uh, in the server. Yeah, and so um, you you know it, it would cause very bad things if you were to you know, dump and restore and get different IDs, because then that would screw up anything that references those IDs. It would break all of your links. It would break up everything. So it's, it's very important that you actually get the same IDs. Uh, and, and that actually is a good point. Uh, it is generation time, not insert time. Those are two very different things. Like, you could generate an object, do some processing that takes, say, an hour, and then insert the object. And the timestamp would be when it was generated, not when it was inserted. So that, that is an important distinction. Yes, it is a one second resolution. Uh, so because it's not just, it, you're, you're, you, it's designed not to ever have any duplicates, but you may have different things in the same second. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but for most applications, any two, you know, any two objects that are inserted within the same second probably could go in either order. Um, if you have something that depends on order, you, you would need to uh, ensure that some other way, though. But if it's just something like, show me the newest 10 blog posts on my site, you know, th that kind of thing, if two people hit enter at the same time, it doesn't matter which one shows up first. Sure. Um, yes. Um, uh, one of these terminals should have something. There we go. Let's see. If I scroll back far enough, I should be able to find it. Um, so really, all you need to do, uh, OK, I don't have enough scroll back. Eh, let's see. Yeah, I was wondering if I had. So all you need to do is make a um, mkdir slash data slash db, um, and then do just run the MongoD binary. Um, alternatively, you can do MongoD uh, space dash dash DB path, and then give it a path to someplace else. So if you want to put it, rather than creating it in the root, you could put it in your home directory, and then give it, a, give it that path. So it's designed to be a 30 second or less setup, um, as opposed to, say, waiting to install SQL Server. And it doesn't need any uh, special permissions other than write permissions to the database path. <clears throat> All right. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, continue on with this blog post. Um, yeah. So what format is that JSON? Like when you say it's a binary JSON. So you can. Uh, I think that's a little out of the scope of this, but uh, you can go to bsonspec.org to see the entire uh, specification. So uh, I just want to talk. Uh, so now. Uh, you know, it wouldn't be a good blog if you couldn't add comments. So here I'm going to create a comment uh, by Dan. Um, you don't actually need to have ID on a sub-object, but I uh, will for uh, reasons I'll show you in a second. Um, and so it'll just have the who it's by and what their text was. Um, here we will have it, um, I'll do an update on the, uh, this post. So update takes a query. Um, and then it takes a, what are we doing to do the update? So here, what we're doing is we're pushing onto the comments array this comment object, and we are incrementing the end comments field by one. And the server guarantees that any single document update actually happens atomically. So both of these changes happen um, at one you know, uh, observable instant in time. And it would also... Um, guarantee that if you were to increment you know, 10,000 times from 10,000 threads, that you'll get the correct result in the end. So you don't have to worry about race conditions if you're doing this style of update. 
Um, additionally, I'm going to go ahead and write a reply to this. Um, you'll note that you could put an in reply to if you wanted to do some sort of a linking uh, from your website with an anchor, anything like that. Um, and then I'll go ahead and push this comment uh, with the reply. So when I do this, um, that will go ahead and make the changes. Um, and then I will fetch them, fetch the comment again. And what you can see here is I'm going to use dot notation to fetch a post where the um, by field of an object in the comments array equals Dan. So this would be uh, using the dotted notation. So here you can see that that fetches it. And this is the new object. So you can see that we now have two comments. Um, and they're in the comments array. Um, and here's the one by Dan. Here's the one uh, by me. Yes? Just wondering how well that tail, you know, out of the box. So you mean, if you do anything fancy, or will that just always do a linear search of all of the comments? It will do. It will do. Um, so assuming you don't do an index, it will actually do a linear scan over everything. Yes, you will have to add uh, an index. It's, um, I'm going to use the term semi-manual in that you don't have to maintain the index uh, as you would with some you solutions. Say, yes. It's very similar to a relational database in that respect. Um, even though the data model is different, we keep a lot of what you know, we think are the good parts of a relational database. And we think indexing is a good part. Um, one difference here, though, is that when you if you were to index the comments.by field, um, what that would actually do is it would insert two entries in the index, one for Dan, one for Matthias. So anytime you have an array, that actually creates a one-to-many um, -many relationship between the record in the, the, the row and the, the entries in the index. So that kind of collapses one or more joins into an index lookup, which is going to be much more efficient than traversing multiple indexes of multiple tables. Yeah. Very, very deep. I mean, so I can have one list of items inside the, the Absolutely. So you could have um, comments, and then inside of it, you could have, um, uh, I'm not sure what you'd want to put inside of a comment, but you could put something in there. Um, uh, so just as an example, the first thing I did with Mongo before I started at 10Gen was actually a, a kind of a logging app. And so we were trying to describe a report that users could generate. And so, as an example, each report had many columns. The columns was an array. Each column could have multiple data sources. Uh, you could also have the column grouped on something. So you'd have group on. Each group could have a list. So you can get really, really, really deep down this rabbit hole of nesting. And then it's the same syntax to query it. It's just field name, dot field name, dot field name, dot field name, colon value. And it will do the right thing, exactly what you'd want when you go to pull that out. <laughs> I've been doing it all along. <laughs> um, so if it changes the size, it may have to move the record if it's larger than the allocated space. Um, so if, if you grow an object, it may have to move it, just because we can't overlap our <laughs> records on disk. Um, but uh, we'll actually heuristically adjust how much uh, space we give. So that way, um, if you move documents a lot, we actually over-allocate. Um, <coughs> but uh, it, it, it will have to rewrite. So one general rule of thumb that I've heard used is that any given object shouldn't have more fields than you'd be willing to count. Okay, I think the question was more about what happens to existing objects of that kind of collection. Oh, so each object has its own independent schema. Just like if you had a JSON documents sitting around, each one can have its own schema. So the documents are designed to be self-describing. So there is no collection schema. It's each document has its own schema. Um, so typically, you, you design your application such that any, whenever you add a field, you can have like a default value that when you fetch it, it would fill that in. Um, let me just take one more, and then I'm going to move on just so I can get through at least the first section of this talk. <laughs> How what? Uh, you would use the, from Python, it would just be using a binary object. Yeah, um, there's a, a special type. Um, in Python 3, you can use the, the, bin de the, just the normal binary thing. Um, in Python 2, you have to use a special binary type. 
Um, <clears throat> so moving on, um, just going to show some of the other stuff that you can do. Um, so here I'm searching for this post and the, where comments.id equals the comment ID. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to update the text of the matching comment to you shouldn't write more. Um, and then I'm also going to update this post and pull comments, uh, pull from the comments array where the ID uh, equals the reply. So I'm basically removing the reply from the comments array and I'm decreasing the uh, comments, num the number of comments. Um, and then I'm going to, um, let me go ahead and run that. And you'll see that when I go to fetch uh, the comments by Matthias, because I removed that, there are no posts that have a comment by me. Uh, and then when I go to run uh, for Dan, you'll see that now his comment has been updated and my comment has been removed. One other thing that uh, any self-respecting blog system should support is tagging. So um, <clears throat> just a very simple, um, just a simple for loop. I'm going to add short, sweet, and stupid as tags to this post. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and update the post object and use add to set tags with this tag. What add to set do, does is it's very similar to push, the difference being that if it's already in the array, it does nothing. So it becomes a no-op, won't add it multiple times. Um, and then I'm also going to update um, ID, the, the tags collection, where ID is tag, increment the count by one, and set uh, with upsert set to true. And what upsert does is it's a um, update or insert if not exist. So the idea is that it will look for something with ID tag. If it finds something, it will apply this update to that document. Otherwise, it will apply the update to the query object and then insert that. So to show you what this looks like, um, you can see that I now have an array of tags. And then when I go to show the tags, you can see that it now created exactly what I'd want. So then if I were to go to you know, start tagging other posts, if there were other posts, um, with different tags, you would then get a, a proper, um, you'd be able to very quickly compute a tag cloud um, in real time. Additionally, you can use the same technique to do hit counting. So if you wanted to have like page hits, um, you could just go ahead and do, you know, your ID is the URL, um, possibly reversed or hashed, depending on how, uh, how many URLs you expect to have. Um, but then insert with ID as the URL, and then increment count by one each time somebody gets a hit. And you don't have to worry about whether or not you've created this object. It goes ahead and creates it for you. Um, I want to run through just a quick list of things that we can do with arrays. Um, so three objects. One has tags A, B, C, B, C, D, C, D, E. Fairly simple. Um, hopefully easy to keep in your head. Um, if I try to do where tags equals A, it will only find one, this object. If I do tag C, because C is in all of them, it will find all three records. Um, so you know, the way to think about it is that whenever you do a, a search on an array field, it will try to match the element in each of the positions in the array. We also have something called $in, which is similar to a, the in operator in uh, SQL. And that's where you would specify an array, of, um, an array of things to query with. And so here it will do, um, this is looking for where tags is either A or E. So the only ones that have that are 1 and 3. There's also all. So if you think of in as an or operator, so this is, it has either A or E. All says has both A and E. Um, so no, nobody has both A and E. Two and three have both C and D. Um, additionally, there's a second argument to find, which I hadn't mentioned. Um, it defaults to returning every object. But uh, so that's the equivalent of select star, which is what you want most of the time. In cases where you only want some fields, um, you can specify which fields you want. Um, but you can also do something to restrict uh, arrays. So if you only want to get the first element in an array, you can use slice 1. If you want to get the last, you can use slice minus 1. 
Uh, additionally, you could use slice 5 to get the first 5 or slice minus 5 to get the last 5. Um, and then you can also do like a skip and a limit on the array. So let's say that you're doing comments and you want to do a pagination, you could say to get the second page of 10, you'd say skip 10, limit 10. To get the third page, skip 20, limit 10. Um, so it gives you a lot of uh, flexibility there. Um, additionally, you can update everything that matches a query. So here I am updating where tags is B, set the matching element of the tags array to capital B, um, and up, do a multi-update. So apply, update every document that matches. And so you can see that here now I've got the Bs are now capitalized. Um, I'll go ahead and mention a, a little library that I wrote called Mongo Magic. Um, it's on GitHub. Um, and one of the, what it lets you do is it lets you use a somewhat nicer syntax in typing out dictionaries when you're doing queries. So um, this is just doing the weird stuff to get it so I can import it from my other directory. Um, and it provides two, uh, two variables, m and and. m is the magic variable. Um, and just to show you what that does. So this lets you say m.comments.by equal equals Dan. And doing some horrible operator overloading, it lets me produce this object. Um, additionally, uh, what that's designed for is so that you could say db.post.find1 m.comments.by equal equals Dan as your querying syntax in Python. And then that would get you back the object that we were looking for. Um, Additionally, it's designed to support Python's um, in-between syntax. So this would be find all comments where um, m, uh, where n dot comments is uh, greater than or equal to zero or less than ten or and less than ten, and that produces an object that looks like this. All right. Um, and as I said, you can find that at uh, this what URL. Is it's, a, it's a magic object from the Mongo Magic package. <laughs> it, uh, it makes a dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> um, it lets you do some, some interesting things. Uh, I couldn't think of what to call it. Um, unfortunately, I can't just, you know, Python has a lot of flexibility, but it doesn't let you override missing, like, if. If you try to reference something that doesn't exist, or like inside of a function, you can't just create your own syntax. Um, at least, not that I know of. It would be kind of cool if you could just like get the syntax tree of the thing that you pass into a function. But I haven't found a way to do that, and it probably isn't possible. Um, also, you're not able to overload uh, the AND operator, uh, which some people would say is a good thing. Um, so there's an AND function is the other thing that uh, I pull in. But um, But it just makes for a nicer query syntax, I think, in languages that support that kind of thing. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so um, does anyone here work with geospatial data or have any interest in working? OK, a couple people. Cool. So um, I'm just going to import a uh, zip code database and run through this. Um, and then I'm going to build an index. So this is syntax for building a two-dimensional index um, on the location field. Um, just to show you what these records look like, I'm going to find two of them. So it's got a zip code in the ID field. Um, as I said, if you have a natural ID, you should just go ahead and use it. Um, uh, it'll have the city, the state, um, the location at, in XY order, um, and the uh, population of each zip code. This is just some data set that I got from the US Census. Um, from here, I can then say um, find, uh, find zip code with 10011, which is the zip code for our office. Um, and then I'm going to set our loc to be this array, um, which is very close to this zip code. Um, just very easy to remember, negative 74 comma 40.74. All right, so from here, um, what you can do is let's find everything uh, with a location near our location, um, and let's limit it to five. So that would look like this. So this just finds uh, these five locations that are 
uh, relatively close. Um, and it actually returns them in, uh, in sorted order from closest to least uh, to, to furthest away. Um, there's also a command. So frequently when you get, um, when you do a sorting, or when, when you get things near something, you want to know, well, how far away is it? Um, so to do that, there's a, a geo near command, uh, which will return, uh, in addition to some other just statistics, So commands are basically anything that isn't a CRUD operation is a command. Um, and the, there's a standardized system for building them up inside the database. Um, and some things will have helpers, um, like count has a helper in basically every language, but that actually gets implemented by calling a command. Um, it's, it's, it's like an extensible, um, an extensible framework for building up more complex operations. Um, <clears throat> this is, it's the actual serialization we use for, uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the location. Don't really worry about that. It's more of a debugging thing. Um, if you're interested in the algorithm, it's actually kind of cool, but uh, not part of this discussion. What are you asking? Ah, that is a very good question, actually. Uh, the distance is in the input units. So if you're using degrees, the distance is in degrees, which don't actually turn out to be useful when you're doing things on the Earth, um, because degrees are of different things. Uh, but we actually have had people do uh, uh, virtual worlds or board games where that actually is a meaningful thing. Um, so now, if you're doing something on the Earth, you probably won't want to use this. Um, you'll probably want to make a very small change and uh, do this. This is the same command. But I'm setting um, spherical to true, so telling it to use spherical coordinates rather than treating the Earth as if it was flat, because you know, as we're well aware, it's not. Um, and then setting a distance multiplier. By default, this would return in radians. Um, that way, it's equally inconvenient for everyone in the world. Um, and then you can put in a distance multiplier of uh, the radius. Of All right. Give me 20 seconds. If that thing will stop ringing. Um. <laughs> so uh, basically, just Google for radius of the Earth in kilometers. Um, one of my favorite Google hacks. Um, you can actually just do that, and it will tell you. You can also say things like miles, and it'll do that. You can also do qubits um, or uh, light years or any other obscure units you wanted to use. <laughs> I believe it's the length from your elbow to your yeah. finger. Oh, <laughs> that used to be a meaningful measurement, apparently. I think that's how they built the pyramids. <laughs> but anyway, so um, here we're doing it in kilometers, so specify a distance multiplier of radius of the Earth. And so when I run this, you'll see that the, uh, the distance that I supplied um, was basically 40 meters from the center of this zip code. Uh, the next zip code is uh, 0.8 kilometers, followed by 0.97, and so on and so forth. So if I wanted to show a, um, you know, you know, just a list of like bars near my cell phone, um, it would then tell you, well, this bar is two, uh, 20 feet away, this bar is so on and so forth. All right, uh, just a few other pieces to this. Um, you can, uh, in addition to doing, uh, finding everything near, um, if you're given a uh, box, say you're trying to put push pins on a map, you'll get the corners. So just throw those corners into uh, within box, and it will let you do, uh, I'm just going to use a dot count to show you how many there are. There are 310. Uh, zip codes within this area. So this is a function of the index now. What do you mean? Well, uh, I mean, you've got an index on the lock. Otherwise, yes. Otherwise, how does, can you do within box on an index? Uh, no, the, all of the geo stuff does require an index. Um, we may remove that requirement in the future, but currently it does require an index. 
Um, additionally, uh, you can say a center and a radius. So there are uh, 537 uh, points within half a degree of uh, the thing I put in. If you said center sphere, it would then use spherical distance to get you um, how many things are within, say, one kilometer of a point. Um, and then also you can combine these with other queries. So you could say everything within half a degree of this location uh, where the state is not New Jersey because nobody cares about New Jersey. Um, so apparently uh, roughly 230 three things were in New, uh, the zip codes were in New Jersey. Um, I don't think I have time to go into MapReduce, um, but it's there. Um, also, we are for 2.2, there will be some things that you don't even need MapReduce anymore. Um, there'll be a new declarative uh, grouping framework, declarative aggregation. Uh, yeah? Um, this is all me, uh, but you need to be running a Mongo server. Yes. Is there an, an embedded way of doing this? There is, like but it's... It. There sort of is, um, but uh, it's not really designed for external users at the moment. Um, currently, it's um, designed to be more run as a server, uh, but some of our tools support embedding it. So the code is there, it's just it's not kind of wrapped up into a nice, friendly API. Okay. Uh, what is the native language of the Mongo server for JavaScript? So do all these Python calls ultimately get translated to JavaScript? So the server itself is written in C++. It embeds a JavaScript engine, um, but you shouldn't use it. Um, in general, um, most things don't actually go through JavaScript. The native language is actually BSON. Um, so what, what will happen is the driver will serialize everything to BSON, which, as I said, is the binary JSON that we use. Yes. Everything gets converted to a, uh, a BSON object, and then that gets sent to the server. And the server, uh, yes. And it, it, it actually, the nice thing with BSON is that it's designed so that the server doesn't even have to parse it. It is the in-memory representation that the server uses. The yes. Yeah. And the nice thing with that is that means that all these objects, it's not that you know, we're, we're using some layer that concatenates strings like you would in SQL. Um, what this does is it just it sends an object as is to the server. And so that means that you can do all these sorts of processing on it. You can construct them very easily in your code. Exactly. It's very similar to Lisp, um, just using dictionaries rather than lists. Um, so I don't want to keep you guys from lunch. So if you have any further questions, um, I'm going to stick around and head to lunch. And, but I'm going to be here all day, so you can ask me then. Thank you. I'll just let you know that this is a web scale presentation. <laughs> right now, there is a MongoDB presentation at PyCon Taiwan as well. Really? Interesting. Right <laughs> there you go. Very well timed. <laughs> Thank you.